We'll just continue on from there. So I'd like to bring John up. I was glad to see you take your jacket off. <laughs> Thank you, Max. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, as, as Max mentioned, the, the intention is that there will be is the mic working okay? You can hear me okay? My wife says I'm mutter, so uh, uh, I'm just clearing up that you can hear me. Um, the intention is that there will be more than more than today's seminar, and uh, so today, um, usually when the lawyer speaks at this type of thing, it's about estate planning and the documents that come with that. Uh, in future, we will be talking about some of the topics that I touch on today in more detail. Today is uh, very much a, an introduction and a summary of uh, the uh, matters that are addressed as you uh, do an estate plan. Um, I clipped out a cartoon on, on this subject a little bit ago, and it's, uh, you can't see the pictures, but there's a, a lady sitting across the desk, obviously from her lawyer, instructing her lawyer as to how she wants to draft her will. And she says, as a last request, I'd like my ashes spread over the gap, uh, sport check, and hooters. And the lawyer said, the gap, sport check, and hooters, you know, we can do whatever you want in your will, why would you do that? And she said, well, my daughter, my son, and my husband will all visit me at least once a week. <laughs> so when I mention the documents that come to mind in doing uh, your, your estate plan, is um, wills and powers of attorney, and specifically a, a will, power of attorney for property, and power of attorney for health care. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what each of those documents does and the information that your lawyer will ask you for in preparing those documents for you. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, at this point, the, the stuff I'm going to be telling you is pretty much like if you were in my office sitting across the desk from me and, and I was taking instructions from you as to uh, how to make your will and powers of attorney. These are kind of the questions I would be asking and this would be the information that you would have to provide to your lawyer. Um, in the case of uh, husbands and wives, spouses making their wills together, uh, anything that is in joint ownership or anything that has a designated beneficiary, as many couples do, doesn't come through your will. It transfers automatically. So if it's, if it's a couple that's doing their estate plan, many couples have virtually all of their assets registered jointly. They have jointly owned property, jointly owned bank accounts, any tax-free savings accounts or any investment accounts they have have designated beneficiaries. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the implications of joint tenancy. But very often on the passing of a spouse, there's not a whole lot to be done with respect to the will because everything passes by right of survivorship. The bigger consideration is if something happens to both of you, uh, how your jointly owned assets are going to uh, be dealt with in that situation. And the other thing is there are sometimes things people, there's some item or items that people haven't thought of. It could be personal property, personal belongings, motor vehicle, some old share certificates they've forgotten they own or something like that. There are times that people have just forgotten about an asset uh, or haven't addressed it with, uh, with joint ownership and so the will covers that. So in preparing your will, the first consideration is who's going to be the executor. And so your executor is the person who is the trustee that carries out the terms of the will. It's a good idea to have more than one executor just in case something happens to one of them or they're unable for one reason or another to act as your executor. And if there's more than one, they can be, uh, it can be two or three executors acting together or they can be alternatives. So you can say, I want my son John to be my executor, but in the, unlike, in the event that he can't do it, I would want my daughter Mary. So they could be joint executors or alternative executors. You want your, res your executor uh, to be a resident of Canada. Uh, 
preferably a resident of Ontario, just for practical considerations, but you do not want a resident of, uh, of another country. So if, if, the, if the family member that you would normally choose as your executor is a permanent resident in the U.S. or England or somewhere else, you, you would not name them as the executor because the if there's a non-resident executor, uh, Revenue Canada considers the entire estate as a non-resident asset and there are significant tax implications of that. So you do not want a foreign executor or non-resident executor. Sometimes it's a challenge to find someone who will be the executor. There's just not a family member that you figure has the expertise or the business ability to be the executor. So it may be, sometimes it is a professional executor. Sometimes people will designate uh, a lawyer or an accountant, their accountant to be their executor because they're familiar with their affairs. Uh, occasionally there will be a corporate executor. Uh, all of the banks now have a trust division that provide that service and they're good at what they do. Um, the only disadvantages to it are that they will always charge the maximum fee that's allowable and quite frankly unless it's a very significant and fairly large estate that's not really the business they're in. Uh, so uh, the times that I do recommend that is if, um, if it's an estate where there's a, a lot of the estate consists of a portfolio of stocks or mutual funds they have the expertise to deal with that, and so in those instances, uh, you might uh, retain a corporate executor. Um, having chose, so so there's there's an order in doing your will. So the first thing is your executor. Having chose your executor, then you deal with specific bequests. So specific bequests can be a bequest of money, like five thousand dollars to each of my grandchildren or specific items. I want my diamond ring to go to my daughter. I want my house to go to my son. So anything that you're pointing to an asset and saying specifically, that's where I want it to go. It can be a bank account. You could say my savings account at the Royal Bank is to go to this person. Anything of a specific nature is, uh, is a specific request and they're, they're spelled out in, the, uh, in order in the will. Um, in an estate distribution, the order is debts are paid first, specific bequests are paid next, and then the residue comes. So if, if you leave $100,000 to your son and the residue to your daughter, and the estate is only 99000 it all goes to the person that got the 100000 because that, the specific items are paid first. Uh, this is where you would, usually this is where you would put any charitable bequests uh, as a specific item. And then there's the residue, and there's always a residue clause. Even if you think you've dealt with everything item by item, there's always a catch-all saying anything that is left goes to my three children or my two children or to some charity or what I have to. Um, I mentioned at the beginning uh, the, uh, the implications of joint accounts and people often put their investments, their bank accounts and their real estate in joint ownership with family members. The reason, one of the main reasons they do that is to avoid probate fees. In Ontario, uh, most wills have to be probated. If there's real estate, it will have to be probated. Different financial institutions have different rules, but generally speaking, if an estate is more than $50,000, you will require probate. Pro probate fees are now called an estate administration tax, which is really what it is, and it's 1.5% of the value of the estate. With property values as they are now, uh, it, 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 it's not unusual that an estate is over a million dollars. So the probate fees on a million dollars are $15,000. So it is an item. That, so that's the main reason that people put uh, items in joint ownership. There may be other reasons. For example, you may have a, an individual might have a joint bank account with one family member just so they can do the banking, pay their bills, and so on. And it was quite clear that if property was joint, regardless of what a person's will said, 
the jointly owned account, and I'll talk about accounts rather than real estate, uh, passed automatically on the death to the survivor, full stop. That created some problems because people would have uh, joint bank accounts with their son who lived nearby as a matter of convenience to pay their bills and what have you. Uh, and then when dad dies, that account goes to the son. The other son says, well, that's not fair. Uh, my dad had a large sum of money in that account. And yes, you did the banking. And yes, you looked after it. He didn't realize that that would go to you. He intended that to be part of our estate. So the law was, is now uh, established uh, by court uh, judge, judgment law, if you will. Um, there was a case in 2007 called PECOR Estate, P-E-C-O-R-E. -E -E. Kind of an interesting fact situation. Uh, Mr. PECOR was a widower. He had three daughters. And over a period of time, and there was significance for that, that he didn't do it all at once, over a period of time, he transferred all of his assets into joint accounts with his daughter, Paula, and nothing was registered in the names of the other two daughters. After he had done that, he then made his will, and his will left the residue of his estate to Paula and her husband. The other two daughters still got nothing, and they knew that. When Mr. Pecor died, um, Paula and her husband had separated. He had never changed his will. Paula's husband brought an application to the court saying, um, although those assets were registered jointly, that was to avoid probate fees, that was a matter of convenience, it was still really his account, his uh, estate, it comes into the estate, and I get half. So that went through all three levels of the court. The reasons they gave were different, but at each level of the court, uh, the Ontario Court, the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court of Canada, in each case, uh, ruled in favor of Paula, so the, uh, the property did go uh, to her by right of the joint account. However, the court analyzed the facts very closely and made it clear that there can be cases where a joint account does come back into the estate. And the evidence in that case that uh, Paula's husband pointed to was that after these accounts were invested jointly, uh, Mr. Pecor in each case uh, had it set up that he had to sign, in other words, that Paula couldn't draw money out on her own accord, he had all of the investment slips come to him and made it clear that he was responsible for all the tax on the account and he in fact controlled the investments. So there was evidence that, um, that the intention was to retain it as his own asset, eat assets even though they were registered jointly. So the bottom line of the court decision is, was that it depends on the circumstances and the evidence as to whether a joint account is intended to go by right of survivorship or whether it is still intended to uh, form part of the estate. So we put a clause in the wills we draft now dealing with that specifically. One of the things we explore with clients is do you have or do you intend to establish any joint bank accounts with any of your beneficiaries? And so we put in a clause saying if uh, any bank accounts that I own with any family member, I do intend to go to them by way of survivorship. And that precludes having to look at the external circumstances. Or conversely, we will say I have established a bank account at the Scotia Bank where I bank with my son John as a matter of convenience and it will pass to him by right of survivorship, so there will not be probate on that account, but I do intend that it forms part of my estate. So that precludes that the kind of case that happened in PCOR, where the court can be asked to look at the circumstances to determine what your intention was in drafting the will. There are still uh, unfortunate situations in families where uh, people set up joint accounts and I don't think they really realize um, that having done that, uh, they in effect have, in many cases, in effect what uh, setting up a joint account does, it takes that asset out of your estate. Uh, so, and, and it can become 
contentious. So that's a clause that's to be dealt with in your will. Another one to be dealt with in your will is, does anyone in your family owe you money or have you made significant gifts to family members? Because often it's not uncommon that parents uh, lend money to or provide money to assist family members with down payments on their house or uh, with education or whatever. There may be one family member that has received more from mom and dad than the others. Uh, do you intend that to be repaid or was it a gift? So we always ask, is there anybody in the family that has a loan to you and how do you want to deal with that? Uh, because if, again, if it's not, this happens where the other family members know that one family member received an extra $50,000 before the person passed away. Uh, the person who received it is going to say, well, yes, I did, but that was a gift and you need to determine whether that was in fact the case. And often in that kind of situation, there is no documentation, there's no promissory note or anything like that. So we explore that in preparing the will. Your will may contain, situate, may contain instructions regarding funeral arrangements. Uh, it's fine to put that in there. Uh, if you do that, it's important that family members know that because uh, it's quite common that people leave their will with the, for safekeeping with their lawyer uh, in, in, in their vaults, uh, and it's important that people know that and know that there is information in the uh, will regarding their funeral arrangements because more often, most of the time, in fact, uh, no one comes to see the lawyer until after the funeral has been completed. Uh, I do tell people that you really do your family a favor if you pre-arrange your own for a funeral. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just, I've been the executor of the states, and it's just so nice when you phone the funeral home if they say, oh yes, that's all looked after, we'll take it from here. And so it just, uh, it, makes it, it makes it much, much easier for family members. Uh, just to go back a moment to the specific bequests, if it's a case where I want my diamond ring to go to my daughter, I would put that in the will. Very often, with particularly with the uh, uh, older people, older clients, they do have lists of their personal belongings because they thought about who should get, you know, somebody gave me a gift at a certain point and when I'm gone I wanted to go back to it. So if there's a number of items like that, I suggest that people make a list and there's a clause we put in the will incorporating it and it just says my personal items and household contents are to be distributed according to a will or according to a list that I will leave with my will. Then you can change the list without changing the will. So that is um, sort of a quick overview of the, of the factors you need to consider in making your will. Uh, one other thing I will mention, uh, if people have, I mentioned probate, there are some items, some assets that do not require probate, such as personal belongings, vehicles. A major one is shares in a corporation. So if you're one of the assets of your estate is shares in a company, people often now will do two wills. They may say exactly the same thing, but there's a primary will that deals with your entire estate, and then there's a secondary will that deals only with the non-probatable assets. So the secondary will would say my shares in XYZ Corporation are to go to my three children, and that takes it out of the probatable uh, asset. So you don't have to pay probate fees on that. So if you hear people talking about two wills, um, that's what they're talking about. Sometimes people, if they own property, and this is not uncommon, people own property in Florida or Arizona, those are the common areas, uh, they will prepare another will in that jurisdiction with the lawyer there to deal with it. That is simpler. Uh, however, if you are an Ontario resident and you make an Ontario will, it will deal with your worldwide assets. It's a valid will. So uh, the, after your passing, the Ontario will, when probated, can be sent to a lawyer in Florida uh, to deal with, to do the same thing that's been done here with your assets. But, uh, in some instances, it is, it is in fact simpler if there's, a, if there's a will in the foreign jurisdiction dealing with the assets in that jurisdiction. Uh, so I mentioned there are uh, two powers of attorney. Um, there's actually three. There's, there's, there's the power of attorney that's always existed. So 
if you go to the bank, if you have a business and you have an accountant in your business and you want them to have signing authority on your account right now, uh, that's a general power of attorney. It's governed under the Powers of Attorney Act uh, and it's, it's basically a business type document. The powers of attorney that we're talking about are under the Substitute Decisions Act. And they cover if you become, and, and the, the power of attorney for property is sometimes called the continuing power of attorney. Those words are interchangeable. The reason they're called continuing powers of attorney is you make them while you are capable, but it is only used if you become incapable. So it, it continues beyond your incapability. That's why it's called a, a continuing power of attorney. Um, and so the, the substitute decision maker, only as long as you are able to make your decisions, uh, you, you do so and the power of attorney only becomes active when you become incapable. So everybody's will is going to be used someday because we're all going to die. Uh, right, but most powers of attorney are never used. Most people make their own decisions until uh, until they pass away or the majority of them. If, however, you become incapable through um, accident or illness or just deterioration of your cognitive abilities, and you don't have those documents, uh, it, it is the process to have someone appointed as a trustee. Uh, is more costly and more cumbersome, really, than if someone dies without a will. Ninety-some percent of the time now, when people do wills, they also do both, cut both types of powers of attorney. So the question that's sometimes asked is, how do you know when it needs to be used? Uh, those That is defined in the legislation. Uh, a person is incapable of managing property if the person is not able to understand information that is relevant to making a decision in the management of his or her property, or is not able to re appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of a decision or lack of decision. So, the power of attorney of property, you have to be able to understand what property you have, you have to be able to understand what financial obligations you have, you have to be able to judiciously manage your affairs and understand the implications of that. So uh, you have the right, if you have capacity, to make a $10,000 cash gift to anyone you want. But it's, if you don't understand the implications of that, uh, then you do not have the capacity to manage to be managing your, your affairs. So that's the defined term, and it's really all about un understanding. You have the right to make bad decisions, as we all do, uh, as long as you understand fully what you're doing and the implications of that. You know, that if you, if you continue giving away substantial sums of money the way you are, uh, you're going to be financially dis destitute if you understand that. And so it's all about understanding. The uh, test for capacity for personal care is also de defined. If they're not able to understand information that is relevant to making a decision concerning his or her own health care, nutrition, shelter, clothing, hygiene or safety, or is not able to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of a decision or lack of decision. So in a situation, and I'm sure we all have encountered this or heard about it, where someone you see their living conditions and how they're managing and you think they really would be better off living in some sort of assisted facility or living with someone else. Uh, and that may be true, that it would be better for them, but if they have the ability to understand that, that it would be better for them, and I fully understand that, yes, you're right, but that's not what I want, if they, if they have the capacity to make that decision, they're quite entitled to do that. Um, so in drafting the power of attorneys, powers of attorney, usually it's not an issue. People come in and they say, we want to make our wills and their powers of attorney. They tell, tell the lawyer what they want, who they want to appoint. Uh, sometimes people have specific things they want in their uh, power of attorney for health care, things like uh, 
Uh, they do or don't want organs donated. They don't want blood transfusions in, in some situations. Those, those would be the power of attorney for, for health care. Usually it's not a question of whether they have the capacity to make it. It's, it's often people uh, make the appointment, come in, prepare the documents, and, and it just doesn't arise. There are situations where the, the person, the lawyer making the power of attorney does have to do um, um, some assessment and draw some conclusion as to the person's capacity. Now, a lawyer is not a capacity assessor, but we do know what the issues are, what the, what the tests are that I've just mentioned. And so you will engage the person in some discussion to determine a little bit about them and a little bit about why they're appointing the person they're appointing. And who, you know, if they have three children, why are you appointing this one? Um, and there are times where there are, there is concern. If there's serious concern, uh, the lawyer may not prepare the documentation until uh, there is a, a medical assessment or an assessment done by a qualified assessor. Not every medical person is is able to do an assessment. There are people that are. are uh, licensed and qualified to do that. And there are situations where you would not prepare the documentation until you know that that's the situation. So when I say there's times there's red flags, um, from time to time you, a lawyer will get a phone call saying my dad or my aunt or my uncle's in the, in the hospital or the nursing home and they want to make a power of attorney for health care and property and uh, a will and they want to appoint me. Uh, or something like that. You, you, get, you get a phone call saying that, that, that you, a relative wants to see you in an, inst, in, in a, an assisted uh, placement. And so you will ask, well, how are they? Like, are they, will they understand what they're signing? You often get one of uh, two answers. Uh, one is, I think they would if I was there which is again a red flag, um, if, if they can't, they have to be able to instruct the lawyer themselves. They have to be able to say this is what I want without the other person being there. Uh, the other answer, which does have some uh, veracity, is it depends on the day. And that is one of the challenges with capacity is that that's true. There are people who, on the, if, you, if you interview them today, they're quite capable quite cognizant, give clear and, and sensible instructions, uh, and the next day they're, they're barely conscious or barely able to communicate. Uh, so uh, capacity does be depend on what they're being asked to do, and it does vary by time. Uh, you, sometimes you will ask, well, is it better if I go early in the morning to see them, or is it, does it really matter? And often they'll say, well, it is better if you go before lunch or before the afternoon because their capacity deteriorates through time. Uh, another red flag is, is, is uh, does, does what they're saying make sense, right? If they, if, they, if they have a will and powers of attorney now, and all of a sudden they're, they're changing it to somebody else, you, why are they doing that? Have they been influenced? Have they been uh, pressured? Uh, are they just angry at somebody? Uh, or what, are, what is their rationale? So there, there are situations where you, a lawyer is, is obliged to um, make some inquiries and do some determination of the reason the person is preparing the documents the way they are, and it's really do they have the capacity. The test for uh, the test for uh, the capacity to make a power of attorney for property and a power of attorney for health care are not the same. Uh, the standard is higher for property than health care. Uh, I, I read up to you what the tests are, and uh, you would have to have a, a greater ability to understand financial affairs than to say, you know, if I'm on a, not able to communicate with a doctor, I want my wife or my son to do that. Uh, it's also interesting that. Uh, to be a power of attorney for property, to be for, to be the attorney for property, uh, one must be 18. To be a, an attorney for health care, one must be 16. Um, and the power of attorney for health care also it includes the things I mentioned. It also includes, uh, uh, most often includes, what is sometimes referred to as a living will. Uh, or a health care directive, and that's the end-of-life decisions that 
wording such as if I am so incapacitated uh, through illness or accident that I am in a vegetative state with no reasonable prospect of recovery, uh, I wish life support to be terminated or wording such as that. So uh, the end of life decisions are also in our attorney for health care. It's part of that. I won't go any further with that because I want to leave a bit of time for questions. I know I've sort of rushed through a lot of stuff in a short time, but as I said, if you were if you were sitting across from my table, from me at the table in my office, uh, that's kind of the discussion we'd be having about the documents you want to prepare. So, were there any questions? Or, yes. Uh, regarding property outside of Canada. Regarding property outside of Canada. Yes. If uh, if you have a designated beneficiary for that property, then do you need to have a, a U.S. lawyer? Question is, if they have property outside of Canada uh, and you're a, uh, an Ontario resident, do you need and, and you've designated a beneficiary yes, for that property? Do you need a lawyer outside of Canada? And the answer is no. Uh, when you pass away, the estate trustee will have to retain a lawyer in that jurisdiction to transfer the property. Uh, but in drafting your will, you do not need a lawyer in another jurisdiction. But I'm asking for the property, to, for the property to, to be transferred to the designated beneficiary. Yeah. So in your will, you're saying, I want my, I want my property, my house in Florida, to go to my son John. Uh, and it's an Ontario will. That is okay. No, it's a, it's in the uh, Arizona information. They allow you to designate a beneficiary yes. of the property. Yes. Yes. And so it can be done. It can be done with a lawyer in Arizona doing it, and and it's simpler to do that. But if you have an Ontario will saying I want my property in Arizona to go to my son John, that's valid too. But the Ontario will will be probated here because to deal with your estate here, then it will go to a lawyer in Arizona. So does it avoid probate if it goes directly to the designated beneficiary of the U.S. property in, within the U.S.? No. You pay probate on your worldwide assets. Does that answer your question? Any others? I yes. thought you said that it designates... Sorry, no, go ahead. I thought you said the designated beneficiary no, okay. Desi when you refer to a designated beneficiary, usually that's like a tax-free savings account or a, a life insurance policy or some kind of investment account, you or an RSP or a RIF. You designate the beneficiary on that. In your will, uh, it's a specific. It's a different word. It's a specific beneficiary. So if you say in your will, I want my house in Arizona to go to my son John, that's a specific bequest. But it will still be subject to probate. Do you follow me? No, but do you have a card? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead. So I have wills in place from 2000. Right. Um, much is still the same, except that my four-year-old is now 22 and will no longer going to be living with my, who we said. Is it necessary to redo our wills, or can we just put a codicil with, at the end with any little changes? <coughs> in so the, the question is, uh, when is it necessary to change your will, or can it be done by a codicil? And having done it, your will uh, in 2000, if there's only one change, say for example you now want to change your beneficiary, or change your executor uh, because your son's older, let's say that's the change you want to make, that can be done by a codicil. Or if you made a specific bequest in your, in your will uh, and that no longer applies, you can delete that by a codicil. So a codicil is just a one page Usually it can be more than that, but it's a simple document amending the original will, but it's done in the same way. It's prepared and signed and witnessed by two individuals, um, the same as the will was. If you get beyond that, it's just neither to do a new will. Okay, 
So there are just a couple of other things like I have bequeathed some money to my mother and she's no longer with yeah. us. So just yeah, yeah, just yeah you get to a point that it's just simpler to do it as well. I see. Yeah. Yes. Um, if you have principal residence and you give that to your children, they don't have to pay taxes on it, right? The question is, if you have a principal residence and you give to your children, if they don't have to pay tax, um, if your will leaves your residence to your children, there will not be tax on it at the time it transfers to them. That is, uh, and thank you for mentioning that because I didn't. Uh, that's another reason not to put property in joint ownership with your children, because. If the property, if your house passes to your children through your will, there's no capital gains tax. If you put their name on it now as joint tenants, they become an owner now. And so when you pass away, it does pass to them a right of survivorship. Um, but it is not their principal residence and their cost of acquisition is zero. So they can be subject to capital gains tax on the entire value of the property because it's not their principal residence. So, but if it goes to them by will, there's no tax. And no capital gains. Right. That's a great, great one. Yes. Um, what is it? Yeah, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a very good point because if you consider the capital gains implications of that, uh, it's certainly going to, or likely going to be much more than the, than the probate fees were. The other issue with that is sometimes marriages fail. And so if you put a son or daughter or all the family members' names on the property, they're a property owner. Uh, the spouse may not have an interest in it uh, and probably wouldn't, but it's an issue. Yes? It would be exactly, the Florida property would be exactly the same as the uh, Arizona property. That there would be capital gains? Uh, yes, there probably would be capital gains on it because it's not a principal residence. Thank you. Yeah. But in both cases, because every, I mean, there's probate in every province and every state. They're all common law jurisdictions, but they all have different rules and different forms. So that is why... If you have a property in Florida and your Ontario will deals with all of your assets, you can do that, but your Ontario probated will will still have to go to the lawyer in Florida to, do, to effect the transfer. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>